Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to session three of five of our Mi'kmaq speaker series. My name is Sabrina Whitman, and I'm the coordinator of Indigenous Affairs here at Acadia University. So this speaker series is in partnership between Blues Cap First Nation and Acadia University. There was an MOU signed between the Blues Cap and the university two years ago, which really enables us to have these types of projects together and these initiatives with one another. This event has been funded, so thankful to community culture heritage within the province of Nova Scotia. Originally, we had hoped to have the speaker series during Mi'kmaq History Month, but all of our speakers are quite busy during that month. And there was a point brought up that why do we only focus on Mi'kmaq issues or Indigenous issues during Mi'kmaq History Month when it should be a topic of discussion all year round. So the discussion or the, the series, the different points of discussion throughout the series was selected based off of interest on campus and ensuring that individuals are informed about different aspects of Indigenous ways of knowing. So last week we actually focused on Ndumalik and Two-Eyed Seeing, Ndumalik being a Mi'kmaq understanding of sustainability to understand how important it is to value Indigenous ways of knowing and learning equal to Western systems. And this is especially important for those working in academia and research. We also had a conversation about powwow protocol and regalia, and this connects to just general interest by individuals and also the fact that Acadia hosts a powwow every year with the exception, of course, this past year with COVID. Uh, today's session, we will be featuring Gerald Glode, who I will speak to a little bit more, and he'll be talking about landscape and place names, building more about the importance of valuing Indigenous knowledge and ways of being. And this evening we have speakers talking about uh, Goose Cap First Nation and Annapolis Valley First Nation. These are the two communities on either side of Acadia that are most closely physically associated with the university and have strong working relationships. So there's an interest to learn more about these two communities and their history. And a lot of what Gerald would be presenting today connects very strongly to the conversation that will be happening this evening as well. And then at the end of this month, we have a really special guest speaker. It's Wani Corn Miller. She is an Olympian. She was the co-captain of the water polo team at one point and received a Olympic gold medal. And she survived a shooting, being shot at Oka as a teenager. And she's gonna be talking about culture and racism in sport and athletics. But with today's event, uh, it's really important about how it connects to so much that's happening on campus. Importantly, uh, in relation to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there were calls to action for academic institutions. And there was a body formed called the President's Advisory Council that looked at what Acadia University has to do in response to the TRC. So this is one of those calls to action or a response to those calls of action. It's connected to the initiatives that we're trying to have on campus and making sure that Acadia is responsive to indigenizing the academy as well as decolonizing. In addition to that, it also connects to Acadia's strategic plan, the strategic plan for 2025, where Msit Nogama, All My Relations, is one of the key pillars to work that has to be done on campus. Often we open up a lot of events or all of our events at Acadia with a land acknowledgement. Me being Mi'kmaq, um, it kind of goes without saying that this is our land um, and we welcome everyone to our traditional territory of Mi'kmaq, which Nova Scotia is situated within. Um, and to the folks who are providing support in the background of this event today, I told them, I really don't need to make that statement because I'm wearing a shirt that directly makes that statement itself. It's uh, by a Mi'kmaq designer and it speaks to the 1752 treaty that the Mi'kmaq signed with the British. And it just reinforces the fact that we are all treaty people in the province of Nova Scotia. And these treaties were called peace and friendship treaties. And they're exactly that. They're very different from the rest of the treaties signed across this country. We didn't see land whatsoever when we signed these treaties. What they were about was coming together and 
coexisting and co-managing Mi'kma'ki uh, as two different nations and respecting one another. So that is the basis of what these treaties are about. And that should be the basis of relationships today in Nova Scotia and in Mi'kma'ki and across the country. And that's why these topics of a discussion are so important. So how today will go is I'll hand the floor over shortly to Gerald, who will have amazing presentation and he's going to speak for about an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, he, he could even talk longer. He's wonderful to listen to. And then in the last 20, 30 minutes, I will be looking through the questions that people will be posing and then we'll be posing some questions to Gerald. So there is a Q&A little box that you can put your questions in and we have moderators in the back end who will be looking through that and posting those questions and comments as we go along. So uh, I do want to introduce you now to Gerald Glode. He works at Mi'kmaq Way to Burt. Gerald is an artist, a storyteller. He talks across the province, across the country, and really across North America, maybe even beyond. I don't know his full CV. Um, <laughs> culture and heritage and landscapes and I'm really honored that we're able to have Gerald to speak today. I look to him for his wisdom and knowledge all of the time. Not only is he an exceptional, like I said, storyteller and curator for, for Mi'kmaq Way to Burt, but he's just a phenomenal person overall and I look to him as an elder uh, for myself and a mentor. So I'm honored to be handing the floor over to Gerald and for all of you to learn from his wisdom as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Gerald. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, those were pretty kind words there. But um, I myself, I'm looking just to have my presentation on the screen, so I'm not seeing anybody or anything. So I hope this is all working well. So uh, if I can get a, a yay on that or some confirmation that I'm working. It's looking good on my end, Gerald. All right, then. Well, again, I'm from Mi'kmaq to Bird Cultural Center, which is uh, one of the departments of the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. And the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq is one of four tribal organizations in the province of Nova Scotia that governs the Mi'kmaq Nation. Uh, we've got the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, and as the title says, we are responsible for all the Mi'kmaq communities on mainland Nova Scotia. The Union of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq is the ones that are in charge of the five communities across the causeway there up in Unamagi or Cape Breton. Um, we have the uh, Native Council of Nova Scotia, which is represents the um, off-reserve residents and Mi'kmaq people that live in, uh, in everywhere throughout the province and even uh, beyond the provincial borders. And the fourth and final tribal organization is our traditional uh, Mi'kmaq Grand Council. Now, I work for the province of Nova Scotia under the Department of Education. And as a researcher and educator, I've been seconded actually to um, uh, the Confederacy to work on the Mi'kmaq de Burt project. Now, the Mi'kmaq de Burt project is actually an archaeological site that we have here in the province of Nova Scotia. And it's one of the oldest stated sites in the country of Canada, or north of the 49th parallel. Everything belongs in that Clovis period. And that's what this uh, archaeological site represents. And we're looking to build a cultural center right there on the archaeological site. Uh, these are just some of the samples that we have and that big one right smack dab in the middle was actually one of the very, very first ones found way back in 1948. Now, I'll give you a little reference to the point. Um, I'm actually from the community of Millbrook, which is just outside of Toro, smack dab in the middle of the province of Nova Scotia. And DeBert's about 20 kilometers as the crow flies uh, to our north uh, west. And uh, that there is where the community of DeBert is. And what happened was it was um, a military base that was training the soldiers that were heading over to Europe for World War II. So I just sat there in front of my computer and I typed um, Camp de Burt 1948 and these images put up. And I thought it's good to sort of get a visual of these uh, sort of images that portrayed that way it can take us back in time a little for those who 
can't really relate to things uh, without the visualization. But again, 1948, they're preparing this uh, <laughs> preparing this um, military camp, and they were preparing a recreational field for the soldiers that were being trained there, sort of a ball field and soccer field type thing. And they plowed the grounds and unearthed some of the very first artifacts. Uh, this was one of the pictures that I found when I typed to Bert 1948 shows two little children there picking blueberries in a field in DeBert. And that's exactly where these first initial artifacts were found. Uh, the Dean of the Agricultural College in uh, Bible Hill here, him and his wife were in DeBert picking blueberries, like a lot of people have done literally for decades and uh, they still do today. And when they went there, they found this unearthed uh, field that had been plowed and they had found uh, some artifacts. Now, Mr. Eaton had a background in archeology span and he knew that this was very, very significant. And because Canada had a higher priority, and that was a war effort, the archeologists actually didn't get on site till the early 1960s. But when Mr. Eaton was looking at this point, he realized because of the style of it, it goes back to a Clovis period some nine to 14,000 years ago with that little channel and that little groove on the very, very bottom of it. Uh, seven to 9,000, they started to stem these um, projectile points. And then earlier than that, three to five and five to seven, they started to put notches on the sides of these uh, stemmed areas. So there's sort of a transition and progression of the technologies of the day. and just by looking at an artifact, you can tell roughly what date or what time period it comes from. Now, this shows Dr. Um, George McDonald there in the little hat, uh, digging down into the soils of DeBert. It was like 1962. And again, trying to put us back physically with visuals, this image shows two uh, main things, which is the sandiness of the soil there, which is actually glacial debris from all the um, debris and dust and dirt that had sort of stuck to the glaciation. As the glacial ice was melting, this stuff put a deposit there. Another thing it shows is the depth of the living floor, some 50 to 100 centimeters below the actual floor, living floor that we have today. And all the debris and dead branches, uh, residual branches, the leaves, they've created a mound of topsoil on top of that as well. So you're digging down quite deep, probably the depth of a table. And uh, that's where things used to be some 13,300 years ago. Uh, again, another one of the pictures showing the team working back in the 60s. And uh, Again, when the Department of Education was talking about this find first in the 1960s, they were saying this is an Indian arrowhead, and there's something definitely wrong with that. Um, along with the 4,800 formal artifacts that they found, they actually found 18 fire hearths. And in the fire hearth was carbon material that they could have carbon dated. Now, uh, they have a thousand years of occupation which represents 10.1 thousand years ago to 11.1 thousand years ago. We use the average of 10.5 thousand, right smack dab in the middle when we talk about the um, carbon dated years of that site. But that actually translates again from radiocarbon dates to actual calendar years to some 13,300 years ago to 14,000 years ago. Uh, they said that this was a projectile point of a um, bow and arrow, and that's two things wrong with that. Number one, it's too large uh, for a bow and arrow to throw. You wouldn't go very far or hit very hard. And another thing is 13,300 years ago predates the technology of bow and arrows. Uh, bow and arrows basically came up about 8,000 years ago, so this is older than that. What we're looking at here is the grandfather of the bow and arrow, and that's the Adeladal and Dart system. Uh, the Adeladal and Dart is definitely a spear throwing device, uh, the weapon of choice some um, 13,000 years ago. And again, something that you could uh, 
throw farther, faster, harder, and stronger than you could just a regular spear. And again, you're using the science of leverage and stored spring energy to throw this device. Now, uh, some of you may have a device like that today, uh, whip it or a chuck it for playing fetch with your dog. There's this little lever that you throw a tennis ball to and literally with a simple flick of a wrist, you can throw that tennis ball quite a distance. And um, that's what you're doing with the Adaladal and Dart is uh, this sort of an animated sequence of how it works. And you're throwing this five to six foot projectile with this little um, lever or shaft. So literally, if you have to throw a spear, you can only move from point A to point B is how far your arm extends backwards to where it is released in front of you. Now, the only way you can increase that is by increasing the length of your arms. And you do this with that lever, making it a greater distance that you pass through in the same period of time, totally accelerating the um, atlatl and giving it enough power to penetrate the megafauna's large uh, fur system. Uh, the hide was very thick. The muscle structure was very, very large. And um, they had to get through to the vital organs in order to harvest uh, large pain. And again, this adalatal and dart, um, it's something that has been found on six of the seven continents on the planet. So it doesn't matter what your ancestry is, uh, your ancestors definitely use this as well. It goes back some 20,000 years in different parts. The only place it hasn't been found yet is Antarctica. And again, that uh, just means that they haven't found it yet. It may still be there somewhere under two kilometers of ice. Another story that we get from these projectile points was we had enough blood residue that was inside all the cracks and crevices of some of these ancient tools. And we could scrape off with an X-Acto knife enough blood to fill the top of like a, a bottle cap. That's uh, what you needed back in the day in 1960s to get an accurate carbon date. There's quite a bit of material. Today, you can just do it with a little speck the size of the head of a pin. You can get accurate um, carbon dates. But when we had this blood sample sent away to be analyzed, it came back and it said that it was caribou kin. It didn't say it was the blood of the caribou. It was basically the ancestor of the caribou. And what we had some 13,000 years ago, looking back at their history, was the stag moose. It was a large, again, like I said, megafauna animal that was part of the caribou family. 150 to 170% larger than the caribous that we have today. It was our main source of food and hide, um, using the sinew, the bones for tools. So we used a great number of um, pieces of the uh, stag moose. And even when you say caribou kin and the relationship to it, it's like caribou is a word that we know very well today. Uh, caribou is on our 25 cent piece. And um, it's also the little animal that pulls Santa's sleigh, uh, known to the Europeans as the reindeer. But here we call it the caribou. And that there is a Mi'kmaq word in the Algonquian verb-based language. The original word is actually kalibu. And Kalibu in the Big Mom Verb X language means to shovel. And that's what these animals do is uh, they shovel the snow to get to the grasses and they shovel the lichens and mosses off of the rocks and trees in order to feed. So that's a part of our talk today is we're going to be looking a lot at language. And being verb based, it is very, very descriptive or very, very distinctive how things got their names. Uh, even talking about Migamagi, breaking that word up, you see in Migamagi, Agi is basically um, the, the land of. And of course, Migamagi is the land of the Mi'kmaq. You look at the center of that map, you see in Cape Breton Island, which is Unamagi. The Magi is land of the fog. Un is fog. Uh, just looking at these area of uh, Migamagi, it represents the Atlantic provinces. It encompasses all of Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, the central and eastern coast of New Brunswick, the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, and even northern Maine is part of the Mi'kmaq Nation. 
And you think of even down in um, the U.S., they have the um, Aroostook um, uh, Micmacs and using the old name that we used to go by. But even looking closer to that, you're seeing the Mi'kmaq terms of the districts that we had. And with that verb-based language, they definitely tell you a lot. It represents when people first moved into this area after the last glaciation. This is basically the continent of North America as we know it today. But going back some 14,000 years, you had it covered with a sheet of ice, the glacial ice. And as that planet started to warm up here and that glacial light started to recede farther north, it started to warm up. Vegetation started kicking in. Animals are following the vegetation and the people are following the animals. Even when I was a young fellow going to school, we learned about ancient cultures and heritage. We studied King Tut in Egypt. And I was like, well, that's only 3,300 years ago since the pyramids were built. And when you take a look at our culture here right in Nova Scotia, we've got evidence that goes back over 13,000 years. I was like four times the uh, period of time that King Tut's been in Egypt. It's like uh, we definitely have a story to tell here. Uh, even taking a look at some of the work that we have with uh, modern day scientists, you're looking at geologists, you're looking at the work of glaciologists that have been studying the changes of ice during their present presence here in uh, Mi'kma'ki. Now, what you have is people are where you come from. The Mi'kmaq, we come from this area, Mi'kmaq. We migrated into this area from the south and some of us stayed and became the Mi'kmaq nation. Some of the other nations moved on and settled in other areas and they became other nations like the Mohawks, the Nishinaabe, the Ojibwe, the Cree. They're all still part of our family and still part of our language group and we share a lot of the cultural practices and protocols um, that we have and um, our nations are very, very similar to those. Even when you think of the ones that are farther north than us, they're the Inu, we're the Olnu. It's like there's a connection again there through the those. But even looking at glacial maximum some 14,800 years ago when it was still a block of ice, You've got a lot of meltwater coming up through the Laurentian Channel between Cape Breton and um, uh, Newfoundland. And when you take a look at it over periods of times, you're seeing 13,300 years ago, the green is where the landscapes are, the white is where the ice cap started to cover, and then the blue is definitely where the water is. Now, again, looking at that Laurentian Channel, it's very wide and it's very, very straight. So what that indicates is you've got a large volume of water moving over a very short period of time. If it was a lower volume of water over a longer period of time, it would find the lowest point of elevation that would wind and weave through, just like sort of the water systems run through the land and they, um, the erosion channels that you have. Now with glacial maximum, you're seeing the very, very edge of it. The water levels were a lot lower. You're talking about two kilometer thickness of ice. As the ice was melting, it created these erosion channels out there. And when you take a look, I don't know if I can get my mice house going without flipping pages. But again, when you look at the erosion channels whoop, that run through there, you're seeing that the water pressure was pushing it out farther where that channel is. So there was a lot of water volume pushed in the first thousand years. And then we start to look at 12,000, water levels are starting to rise. Uh, again, the land is starting to be open. People are moving freely through the land this way. 11,000 years ago, uh, some 10,000 years ago, it's looking very, very close to the shorelines that we have today. Mind you, there is a piece of land that goes from um, Prince Edward Island to mainland Nova Scotia along the Northumberland Strait. That was still all land. 9,000 years ago, there was sort of a, a surge of land that popped up and the water level set farther out and there was more land. But you can see that slowly, gradually um, dropping of the um, Grand Banks of Newfoundland as well as the Ipswich Channel that runs from Massachusetts into uh, Shelburne or Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. 
they get about 6,000. 6,000 years ago, you're getting a large change in um, our shorelines that basically took us to where we are today. The Northumberland Strait is opened up now. 6,000 years ago, the Bay of Fundy was formed in the, like I said, the Minas Basin was formed, I'm sorry, in the Bay of Fundy. And again, you can even see um, little uh, Sable Island off the coast there is um, quite a bit larger. Then when you take a look at today, there's uh, not a lot of difference. But again, that definitely tells the tale. And having a background with Department of Natural Resources for 25 years before I started with the Department of Education, I worked a lot with aerial photographs, uh, the main technology of the day. Uh, today, we have the LIDAR system, which is a much better and newer version, where you're not just taking photographs of something. You can actually send sound waves through the canopy of the trees that'll give you the landscape as well as through the water systems and they'll give you images of what things look like so even looking through google earth you can see where glacial maximum was where the water levels were as well as the erosion channels so that's definitely a part of our our story here uh, being occupied through this whole process and the length of time that we've been here as well as the land changes that we've had to deal with uh, when you talk about this nation and people that moved in here and stayed, there's 13 tribes in the East Coast that formed what was called the Wabanaki Confederacy. And these were treaties that we had before European contact. And when you take a look at that verb-based language, Wabanaki or Abenaki means people of the dawn or people of the early morning light. And that's exactly what we are here on the East Coast of North America. We're the first nations to see the sunrise as the planet Earth turns into the sun each morning. All of Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, the eastern shores of New Brunswick, the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, and even northern Maine. That's Mi'kma'ki, that's part of our Wabanagi, and uh, definitely found in our, um, our verb-based language, in our language, and uh, in our culture. Now, we had a great um deal of science involved with this we followed the uh, moons of the year we uh, have 13 moons which basically means the moon goes around the earth thir time, 13 times as the planet earth travels around the sun for one annual journey and each one of the months of the names of our our year are based on something that goes on in the environment during this moon period uh, for example, this is Punama Keuikus, and Keuikus is found on every month that, of the year. Keuikus means the moon cycle or the moon time that this happens. The Punamo is basically the Tommy Cod. Punama Keuikus, the month of January, what happens is the Tommy Cod are coming in to spawn. They come in with the, the tides, and so does the ice chunks. Now, when the tide turns here in Nova Scotia, the ice jams lock it up. The waters swell up over the shores of the rivers and the tommy cod would be deposited there. Once it reaches tidal maximum, the tides basically break the ice fields, the water runs down, and our people would basically walk the shores of the rivers picking fish. And that was basically what would happen at this time of the year. And that's how we got the name. Uh, I could definitely go into all the other months, but uh, this presentation's on another topic, so we'll save that for another time. <laughs> but even part of that Algonquian language, there's 55 different tribes in Canada and the United States that are connected through this migration path. Basically represents people from the southern US moving up following that ice, ice line till we hit Mi'kma'ki where we are today, and then moving north and west. And you can see that it's very much related to uh, habitat. You go farther north that, you're talking about the uh, ice fields of the north. You're talking about the Rocky Mountains over there. That's a definite different um, environment and a different way of life. And that's where culture comes from. Even looking down to uh, where Minnesota is and uh, Denver, Colorado, 
it's like you're starting to get into the great plains down there it's like that's a different habitat as well in a different way of life so this group of algonquian families definitely uh, are connected i'll give you an example of this uh i tell a story about our late chief uh, uh, Chief Gerald Tony from Annapolis uh, Valley First Nation. Um, he was a mine surveyor when he was a young man. And he was in a, a mining camp right on the border of Alaska, up in Northwest Territories. And he came across a trapper from northern Manitoba. And Gerald got talking to him and being just the only two people out in this remote area, Gerald invited him in for a cup of tea. And this trapper said, well, he said, I trap six months of the year. I trap three months of the year into Anchorage, Alaska, and I sell my furs. And I trap three months back home, and I sell my furs to the Hudson Bay Company. So when Gerald invited him in for tea, he said, oh, you mean Bedaway? And Gerald said, excuse me, what did you say? He goes, Bedaway. He says, our Cree word for tea. He said, actually, it's our Cree word for broth, but you can make tea out of anything you boil. And Gerald said, you got to be kidding me. He said, I'm from 6,000 kilometers here in the valley of Nova Scotia. He said, I'm Mi'kmaq, and our Mi'kmaq word for tea is Bedaway, and it comes from our word for broth. So it was at that point in his life that he realized exactly how old our culture is and how far it goes, literally from one side of the continent to the other. It's like that language family has definitely been shared and connected for thousands and thousands of years. And that's part of that Mi'kmaq worldview is the connectiveness to everybody and everything in our nation. And getting talking about the land itself, uh, when I started with the with the Mi'kmaq DeBerg Cultural Center, the first project my boss, uh, Mr. Tim Bernard, he assigned me was to collect all the legends of Glooscap Cap that I could find and read them. And if there was a a location, he said, I wanted me to map them. And I said, sure, like, no, well, that's the first thing I had to do was read all these stories. And not all stories made reference to certain places, but there was a great number of them that did. Uh, you're looking at the legends of Glooscap Cap and the uh, history of the Mi'kmaq people. A lot of them, like I said, not in written form until European contact. Uh, one of the most prominent collections of stories is, of course, the Legends of the Micmac by Silas T. Rand, who was a Baptist minister who lived with the Mi'kmaq for some 40 years. We're going back to the 1800s here. Uh, this publication was done in 1894, and that was after several decades of living and learning the Mi'kmaq language and uh, collecting this uh, series. Another great book that you'll find is the Mi'kmaq Indians of Eastern Canada. Uh, there's literally tons of volumes of books that have been done over time. Some of them are 100 years old and some of them are even older. But what was happening was these ethnographers were making this rush to this area of eastern Canada. And they were being told that this tribe of Indians that lives in eastern Canada, they're going to be dead and gone within 20 years. So we had tons of these ethnographers, like I said, Charles Godfrey Leland and uh, Silas T. Rand, Wilson and Wilson, like, you know, the Carlton. It's like all these different ethnographers were collecting our stories and putting them in publications. So when I was looking for place names, I really, really had to do my homework. I found one story that referred to a story site as being Konomi Akadi. And I was like, well, Akadi, that's from more modern times, and that's when the French had it. So I had to go back through this um digital map um database and find all the historical maps that were here and sure enough i found konomi akadi in this map from i think it was 1668 or no 1768 uh no it must be 1668 because it was before the british uh, expelled the french but anyway i found it in the town of economy economy is a very english town Economy is a very, very English word. The English took it from the French. The French had a, a colony there for 80 years, and it was called Lekanomi. Now, phonetically, when the English took it, they converted the name from Lekanomi to economy just because phonetically that's what it sounded like. 
but the French have it for 80 years. They had it from the Mi'kmaq, and the Mi'kmaq referred to it as Konomi. And so the French just called it Lekonomi. Now, again, looking at that Mi'kmaq verb-based language, it's like, what does Konomi say? Well, Konomi in our language translates to a piece of land that juts out into the water. And sure enough, if you look at the shoreline of the Minas Mason, there's this little bump, and that's where economy is. It's where Lokonomi was, and it's where Konomi is. So it's transcended three different cultures and three different language, but it still stays true to the Mi'kmaq verb-based language that we, that we had and still have today. So again, this is what my map basically looked like when I start to populate a lot of those highly concentrated around the Minas Basin and the um, Bay of Funde. And again, even looking at Mi'kma'ki itself, looking at those words, they say quite a bit. Now, you take a look at the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, it was called Gaspoic. If you take a look at the valley of Nova Scotia from Yarmouth to Shelburne and Digby, that was Gaspoic. Gaspoic and Gaspoic are almost the same thing and they almost say the same thing. You take a look at Gespoic. Gespoic means um, the end of land. So you get out to the end there and you've got water all the way around you along the horizon. So that's the end of land. If you go all the way up to the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, our northernmost region, you're finding Gespoic. Gespoic translates to the end of our land or the end of our territory. You go beyond that, you're running into Mohawks and Iroquois, uh, other nations. So again, that verb-based language definitely acknowledges that. Sicknick, the area between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, as long as the St. John River Valley, Sicknick means marshy area. It's quite evident if you drive through the Tantramar Marsh, one of the largest marsh systems here in uh, the uh, Atlantic uh, or Eastern uh, North America. And if anybody's ever seen any pictures or any uh, shows or movies about uh, the Serengeti, uh, this is what Sicknick was like. Very, very marshy, very, very lush area. And with the vegetation, animals could feed without worrying about predation. Um, there was a great place to go and hunt. And even after European contact, when people started to come here in the 15 and 1600s, for 200 years, Canada did not have a, a monetary or currency system. Uh, we used the fur trade for the first 200 years. And some of the most valuable furs in the forms of uh, minks or otters or muskrat or beaver furs, uh, they're all coming from these marshy areas. So. This was a very, very highly sought after area. And there were battles fought in between the Mi'kmaq and the Mohawks who were trying to like, you know, approach on our area to harvest these, um, these fur-bearing animals. So a lot of battles held in the Sikmi. Eskigawig, you take a look at that. I've got an elevation map there. You can see there's not a lot of mountains, not a lot of valleys. It's pretty much a flat plateau. Uh, Eskigawag translates into skin dressers territory, and that doesn't mean the people who dress in the skins of animals. Uh, back in the day, we all did. It just means the ones that harvest the animals for preparation. Eskigawag was the migratory path of the uh, migratory path of the uh, migrating caribou herds. So it was very, very important to the people there that would harvest prepare these furs and use them for trade to other people from different districts for things that you couldn't get there. And one of those things are the lithic materials or the rocks that you needed to make um, tools out of. So a lot of the tools that were made into the arrowheads and the spear um, heads, they would be coming from other areas and being traded for different goods. So trade was a very, very big part of our system. Abiguet is the town or the province of Prince Edward Island. And Abiguet means a small body of land that sets out in the bay. And literally, when you look at the Northumberland Strait and the part of the Atlantic, the eastern shores of uh, New Brunswick, 
uh, yeah, it is a little piece of land that sets out in this bay. Now, Newfoundland is a large body of land, and it was called Takamcook. And Takamcook means a large body of land that sets across the sea or it means a large body of land that sets across the ocean. So even when you look at that word and break it up and you realize that across, across from what? It's like, well, that's across from us to oh, the lands over there. So that was our word for that place. It wasn't uh, something that was inclusive. It wasn't something that they had developed there. It's a word that is what we used for them. Uh, Unamagi, I mentioned again, is definitely the land of fog. And because of the cold waters coming from the north and the warm waters coming in from the south, you get that mixture and you get fog more times and more days a year in Cape Breton Island than you do in uh, mainland Nova Scotia or even other parts. So Unamagi, the land of fog, is definitely very, very strong. Digamanakadik, that's basically uh, what we know today. It's been anglicized to Shubanagadik. It was one of our original um, districts. It was uh, one of their main rivers. It was uh, one of our main communities, uh, Sibiganakadik. And even when you look at Akadik, it's like that there is sort of a suffix that goes on the end of a word to tell you something. When you see Akadik, it's like um, it means the place where. It's like the place where what? Well, the place where the sigabun comes from. Sigabun is a plant that grows in the waters. Uh, even when you look at like Stuyakadi or Benakadi or Trakadi or Uniak, it's like that's all Mi'kmaq traditional names. And in that verb-based language, it tells you the place where you, the great encampment is, or the place where you go to gather eggs, or it's like you look at the other words that are involved in it, create it. Verb-based language, very descriptive, very distinctive. This is the sigabun plant, and it grows in the water systems. Uh, that's it during its flowering system in the summer. Uh, you actually harve it and harvest it in the fall, and this is the fruit that you're getting. It's like a little tuber that grows under the water. And when you're paddling across it, and you see these very, very distinctive leaves with the little points on them, uh, you look down at the roots and you'll see that they're white. And there's like a little white ring that is exposed. The tubers are actually popping up. And the thing is, the Sibigan, when you're talking about the verb-based language, Sibiganakadi, the place where the Sigabun come from, when you look at this plant that actually crowns from the soil pushing up, when a mother gives birth to a child, the child comes out head first. Well, this is your subin. That's the top of your head. So again, that verb-based language is found in everything. You can see how words were constructed and built. Uh, again, it's one of the common names is ground potato, and it can definitely be like that. You can mash it, you can grill it, you can fry it, you can cut it thinly and deep fry it into potato chips. Uh, it's very much like a potato. It's just a little bit more grainier and a little bit more coarse, but you can do anything you can do with a potato. And the reason why it was so special to us is because it was our main source of carbohydrates. It was our main energy food. It would definitely convert into energy. It even helps in the, um, the regeneration of cells if you're injured or it was for it used as a medicine. It's like, you know, there's a lot of things that the Sibigan brought the Mi'kmaq people. Um, they said that if a family were to go out on a canoe trip, in two days, they could get enough sigabun to last them for a year. So it was something that was very, very plentiful, easy to harvest, and like I said, it would um, dry and store for long periods of time. One of the common names is rabbit's head, and you can see how that would be descriptive as a rabbit's head. Another one is arrowhead, is the name of this plant. You can see again how it actually looks like the head of an arrow, but that's just part of one of the districts. And again, Sibiganakadik has been anglicized to Shubanakadik, uh, just as this district of um, Pictuk has been anglicized to be Picto, uh, represents Picto in Anaganish County. And uh, Pictuk in the Mi'kmaq language means the place where ground gases erupt. 
And literally, it was named that for a reason. If you take a look at the geological inventory of the province of Nova Scotia, and you look at that little shark fin just before the Canso Causeway, you're going to see that it is full of a lot of fault lines, those black heavy lines that you see between the colors. Those there are volcanic um, fault lines where the land has been layered and squished together, and it's still very unstable. In fact, um, there's still a lot of uh, sort of um, motions and it's it's still active today in that area. They feel little tremors and little rumblings over in that area. We have a character in our stories. His name is Japichkum. Japichkum is the great horned serpent. He lives underneath the ground. And when the ground shakes, that there is the, the snake moving underneath the ground. When you see it actually crack open in these zigzag patterns, that there is the slithering path of the serpent, Japichkum. He's got two horns. He's got a red horn and a yellow horn that can be seen flashing up from these cracks and crevices. And if anybody remembers just a couple of years ago when Hawaii was going through a lot of earth changes, the ground was definitely crack, cracking up in a zigzag pattern and there were flashes of red and yellow coming from there in the form of magma. Well, that was the Mi'kmaq, living here during the time of Nova Scotia's creation and um, the changes in the landscapes of Nova Scotia. This was the image that we tried to create in the minds of our children. Whenever you felt the ground tremble, it's like run for your life, get out of there, these creatures came in. It's like whenever they saw it split open and crack, again, thinking of this monster, run for your life and get out of the area. Because what's happening is as the Material starts to crack, expand, and the um, magma is starting to flash up in the form of red and yellow horns. The final part is the hissing of the serpent. That's that tss, the sound of the snake. It's like, well, those were toxic gases being released from under the Earth's crust. All these coal, coal veins and sulfur veins from the province, if you inhaled those vapors, they could literally kill you. This was just one of the stories that we had to keep as a sort of a boundary for our children. And even looking at the Nova Scotia, definitely evidence of some major land changes. And these are coming from areas that are not 250 million years old. These are happening, you uh, go up to the um, Funday Geological Museum, they're saying these land changes in Nova Scotia, these happened 6,000 years ago in these certain locations. And the Mi'kmaq been here for 13,000 years plus. They've definitely been here when these earth changes have been made. And the cracking, the folding, the, uh, the heat that has uh, transformed the materials that we have, metamorphic rock or igneous rock that has been created by extreme heat in the province of Nova Scotia, they're not going back as old as you think. <laughs> and even, Looking back at our inventories of stories, I could take us all today, I put us on a bus, and I can take us to a beach. Beautiful beach, beach sands, there's uh, beach grasses, there's shorebirds living on the beach. There's even stones and rocks that have been cobbled round and smooth from the Bay of Funda here, the world's highest tides rolling these rocks back and forth have cobbled them round. But the thing about this beach, it's 150 feet in the air. It's nowhere near the shoreline. <laughs> 6,000 years ago, it used to be. Now, if you look at the top of this picture, you can see that beach that I'm talking about, this raised beach. And right underneath it is volcanic basalt. That's coming out through the cracks uh, that created it. Now, what you've got is you've got plate tectonics where these pieces of land are pushing together under extreme pressure and they're popping. And that's what this represents is this raised beach. Again, the Funded Geological Museum will say that that just happened 6,000 years ago. And the Mi'kmaq in their stories have legends that refer to this event. This one called the time the rivers flowed backwards. And again, had been passed on from generation to generation. It refers to changes in elevation. If you got water that runs downhill, it's in a stream, it flows down into this little creek, it runs off in the form of a brook. A brook is going to run downstream till it hits a river. 
and that river is going to flow off to the shoreline where it meets the, um, sh the shoreline or where it meets the ocean. Now where you got these two plates pushing together and popping up some 150 feet, you've got water that runs backwards or in reverse. So these stories in the verb-based language, they also mean something too. Big Ma never said anything that they didn't mean. And this is definitely part of our interpretation of these lands. And what you get when the earth starts to crack open, you get this liquid material coming up and fusing stones. As it starts to cool, it forms cracks. And inside these cracks, depending on the minerals that are in the soil, will grow out in crystallization. And they're forming all these um, semi-precious jewels throughout the province of Nova Scotia in like multitudes of different colors. These were the stones that are my ancestors used to create tools. Now, on a mosh scale, these things are like eight out of 10, eight and a half out of 10, nine and even nine and a half out of 10. And that refers to the hardness. A 10 out of 10 is a diamond. And these semi-precious jewels are almost there. If you fashion a tool that's out of there, it's going to retain its edge because it's so hard. We're digging up tools that are 13,000 years old and they're just as sharp as the day that they were created. And again, it was that knowledge of the geological inventory, our reference to the gathering places and um, the materials in the form of stone that's been left behind that puts all these stories together. That's landscape, that's land changes. These are some of the images that we have. Uh, these are actually drills. And they're not just little chips off of rocks. You can see the little crown pieces on the top for using to drill wood, drill stone, drill bone. Uh, one of the hardest surfaces that we have is like teeth. And the enamel in the teeth is so hard, but these little drills will definitely drill holes through teeth and through shells. And, um, and again, made by man. It's like you see primary, you see secondary, you see tertial flaking. These were actually created to be that design. Uh, these basic ones are hide scrapers, and again, all about the same size, all about the same shape and design, and used for a specific function, and that is to shave off the animal furs. Then when you dry it, you flip it over and you shave off the, um, the dried animal fats on the inside of the skin. Then you've got a very, very pliable piece of leather that you can soak and smoke and dry continually soak and smoke and dry and you get the softness process getting softer and softer and uh, these were basically hide scrapers then these ones here these are bone wedges and what you're doing is you're using these bone wedges to create tools out of bone so if i lay a, a bone down made from a leg bone of a moose i put this little wedge on it and i smash it with another rock the only thing that's going to break is the bone because that's the softest material in the formula. These stones are very, very hard. And um, again, it's hard. they're hard to break. Uh, there's one place there, Partridge Island, which is about two kilometers from the town of Parsboro, uh, right in the mines base in the Bay of Funday. When you take a look at this paragraph about the geology, like everything in Parsboro is about the geology and about the rocks. The last paragraph on this sentence, or the last paragraph in this uh, piece of text uh, reads, on the shoreline can be found rocks and sediments ranging in origin from 300 to 175 million years ago. And among these materials can be found samples of every, nearly every mineral in the world. And when you take a look at the geological inventory of the province and where Parsboro is located, it's right on the seam of all these different things. Now, when you look up at Spring Hill and Amherst and Picto, that gray area, that's about the only piece of material that's indigenous to the continent of North America. When you look over to Picto County, Anaganish County, uh, and Cape Breton Island, that multiple colors that you're seeing there, that's indigenous to the continent of Europe, like England and France and Ireland. And again, when you take a look from Toro to Kenfo, Lunenburg, Liverpool, Shelburne, it's like that orange part that's down below the southern part of the province, uh, that's indigenous to the continent of Africa. The Pangea basically that broke up, Nova Scotia was smack dab in the middle and 
it left sort of pieces of it. Like you can see how it's connected to Africa on the southern part and Europe again on that northern part. And uh, again, I'm trying to move my mouse without showing. There's Nova Scotia smack dab. So it's got pieces of the other continents that are involved in it. Uh, even when you take a look about that fusion and creation of materials, this used to be a sandy beach. And when you expose sand to heat, it forms glass. Now, if you expose natural sands to volcanic material that's coming up from the Earth's crust, you can see there behind my son Kyle's uh, back there, uh, that there is volcanic basalt that literally come up and cooled inside the water. But the heat was so extreme, it melted the rocks around there. You can see by his finger, um, these little concordal fractures, that there is very, very desirable material. This area has been fused by heat and has been very, very uh, densely compacted. And the process makes it very, very desirable to make tools. Again, looking at that thick that finger, you can see the way that it ripples like broken glass. That's uh, that's what you're looking for when you're finding this material to create the archae archaeological things that we're finding. And just by snapping them off, and it's very very predictable how these coral concordal fractures break off. You can design and you can shape a stone into any desirable tool that you need. So that's definitely the process and how this material was collected to create these tools. We had a project with the Migmoy de Burke Cultural Center. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to go beyond looking at the archeology span as points of time. We figured going back to glacial maximum, we were very restricted to the amount of material that we could gather. East of us is the Atlantic Ocean. North of us and west of us was a solid block of ice. And south of us was the only place that we could go other than locally. We took a lot of our archeological material that's been found throughout the province. We took them to a man in Parsboro by the name of Mr. Eldon George. Uh, Mr. Eldon George was uh, a geologist and a anthropologist and uh, he did a lot of things in his career. And he even was a major contributor to the geological inventory of the province of Nova Scotia, that, that map that I showed you earlier with all the different colors. He made a lot of major contributions to that, to the point that the province actually dedicated that map to Mr. Eldon George. But going to see Eldon, we took him the tools and we asked him um, two different questions. We said, what is this tool made from? And where did our ancestors find it? To give you an example of that, this here is a projectile point some 7,000 years old that was found in um, Dollar Lake Provincial Park in behind the airport. It's made out of red um, jasper and it's got veins of green jadeite in it. That doesn't come from Halifax County. Uh, we actually found this in our soil pit in um, Mi'kma'way de Burt, and it's a core sample. My son was digging a soil pit. He uh, literally found this rock and he thought, hey, it's pretty cool, so he brought it home. And so he was working uh, his way through school and uh, worked as an archeologist for like five different seasons. And when he brought that stone home, I said, you take that back. I said, that's a tool, that's important. You could see that that material was made, uh, has been made into different tools that we have. And again, the red jasper with the green uh, veins of jadeite, you can see that that tool was actually fashioned right from that stone. And the thing is, here we are in Debertas in Colchester County, that material does not come from Colchester County. So when we went to Eldon, he told us where we could find samples of it. And we went throughout the province collecting the material from some 13 different uh, uh, types of rock and types of stone. And some of the types of stone that we had, like there's one that was like an orange uh, an orange agate. Well, there's four places in Nova Scotia that you can get that agate from. So we had to collect all four samples, take them into the uh, museum and study them under like you know, high microscope and high magnification so we could see 
with the matrixing material that sort of encrusted it, we could pinpoint to which one of the four sites that that came from. So it's like, yeah, this is made from orange um, agate. It's like it comes from that particular one of the four. This is actually um, Mr. Eldon George with the red backpack. Uh, Mr. Roger Lewis, which is the provincial ethnographer at the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural Resources. And my Mrs. Natalie Glode, who was a heritage interpreter for four years and spent a lot of time with us out in the field doing research for the um, Millbrook Cultural Center uh, back in the day. So he's a big part of our story is collecting these stones. And what you could see is this is where the archaeology evidence is being found along the shorelines, along the waterways and the major river systems. This is where these sites actually originated as a raw rock. And you could see right away by putting it together on a map, you could see the trade routes and the travel ways of our ancestors. Just from the stones, it's like, you know, it tells you a lot. And then even going so far as revisiting that first um, research project I had where it was naming the places in the stories and then covering that with the lithic sources where the major fault lines are creating these rocks you're seeing that a prominent number of these stories are coming from these sites of cultural significance because they create uh, material of cultural significance uh, even when you take a look at the both sides of the minus basin um, it's called the goose cap trail and the reason why it's called the Goose Cap Trail is because of the number of stories and references there are to legends of the Mi'kmaq people. And this is something that has been designated by the province of Nova Scotia in their tourist industry since the 1930s. So we're coming on to some 90 years of um, being called the Goose Cap Trail. Uh, even taking a look at these uh, sites, um, they fall on the Cubiquid fault line north of the Minus Basin and the um, Minus Basin geofracture that runs through the southern part of the Minus Basin. Every single one of those sites there, you're going to find semi-precious jewels to make tools from. Every single one of those sites there, you're going to find um, uh, stories. From these little yellow dots that you're seeing here, I can tell you a glue cap legend from every one of those places. And the big thing is being on these fault lines and having the material, our Mi'kmaq ancestors who didn't have a written method, what they did was they took Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge and Mi'kmaq uh, ecological knowledge, embedded it in a story and passed the story on. So the information went with it. So when you're looking at some of these story sites, uh, you're definitely finding that uh, they're associated a lot through the waters. Uh, this here is a map of uh, Nova Scotia and the travel ways that we know now through the uh, road system. But when you look at the traditional travel ways, that there's the water systems of Nova Scotia. There's literally nowheres that you can't travel to by water. And that was our system through, through the waterways traveling the shorelines and the interior, running into this material. Uh, it's something that we've been doing for generations. And even today, like you know, I'm 62 years old and I still love to get out onto the land to these places to collect and harvest material. What you're looking for is those evidence of volcanic basalt. Uh, they're throughout the landscape in the interiors and both coastal. Uh, you're seeing these volcanic material coming out from the Earth's crust and uh, drying or cooling at the in the water. Uh, this is up in Arasag. You're seeing the columnar basalts there. Uh, this here is uh, from Briar Island. Now what's happening is the liquid material is pouring over it. It's starting to dry and form cracks, but underneath it's still liquid. So it pushes up through these cracks, just like squeezing a tube of toothpaste is going to come straight up. That's what these columns are or columnar basalts. And again, you're seeing in the uh, Mines Basin off of Cape Chignecto, you see these columns of basalt that are matrix or encrusted by the softer material or the um, sandstone. Now what's happening is the sandstone is all eroded away and you're left with these columns of volcanic material. 
Uh, Cape Door, another site of column number basalt, uh, Horseshoe Cove. You can see where it's come up from the crust. Along those cliff face there, you can definitely find semi-precious jewels, amethyst, agates, uh, beautiful material that you can create tools out of. Uh, Scott's Bay, uh, between um, Blomidon and Cape Split. Uh, Cape Split itself, where I told you about that raised beach where it sort of popped. Uh, Partridge Island is one of my favorite places. I can tell you eight different legends about this one place, so we knew that it was more significant than others. Even the fact that there was a Mi'kmaq community there by the name of Wazok. Wazok was the name of a Mi'kmaq community. Wazok in the Mi'kmaq language means heaven. It's like, why would you give a place such a prominent name? Because, because that place was literally heaven on earth for anything you needed in order to survive. And the material that is created there, there's the, the basalts that can be used. Uh, the hematite is one of the things that is created from it. That's where we get our red ochre from. Using the basalt stones on our fireplaces so they don't explode. Uh, being created under extreme heat, uh, they're not going to fire and uh, blow up on you. <coughs> or even um, these sweat lodges that we had, these volcanic basalts will hold a lot of heat. And uh, that's part of the process of a sweat lodge as well. Uh, Five Islands definitely has material that has been formed by volcanic fusion. And this is what you're looking for, those, those sort of ripples in the stones. You pick up this little tiny thing that's about the size of your fist and it's as heavy as a cinder block because the density has been taken out of it. And when you take two of these rocks and you bang them together, they don't just thud or thunk. They literally ring like a bell. There's like a ting. And they also bounce off of each other because when you grab two and bang them together, the density of it just throws it apart. So banging two rubber balls together or something. It's kind of, you know it when you see it. And this is literally, like I say, a beach that has been fused and been melted. And when you walk on it, it even sounds different below your feet because you're not getting that, that softness. You're getting the, the density and the ringing just even underneath your feet when you're walking on these beaches. Um, when you talk about value of semi-precious stones, of course, today jewelers make a lot of material out of these desirable things. And, I can go online and I can um, I can order uh, five pieces about the size of my pinky fingernail. It's going to cost me uh, fifteen dollars just for these five little pieces. So I'm wondering, what's this worth? It's a solid amethyst and jasper, and there's different quartz and quartzite in it. To a jeweler, for them to take that out, cut it up, it literally be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's just sitting there on a beach in Nova Scotia. It's semi-precious jewel. You can even see above it where it matched, like uh, you get these cracks and crevices. The water will drip down inside there. And then in the winter time, it freezes and the ice expands. It acts like a wedge and it throws material on the beach. Now I can't go in there with harvesting material and just blast away at the cliffs or even take a pickaxe and smack away at the cliff faces. But I am allowed to take anything that has fallen off naturally. And uh, this is definitely a natural fall, but I don't know how you get something that big and heavy out of <laughs> like you know, way back in the woods on the beach somewhere. But that goes into that stories of our culture, the creation story of how the Mi'kmaq people came to be. It's like we were created by three bolts of lightning in the Bay of Funday and the Bay of Funday mud. The first bolt of lightning created the shape of a man. The second bolt of lightning um, brought him to life, but he was still fastened to the earth and all he could do was observe and learn. The third bolt of lightning set him free where he could walk out, where he was introduced to different members of his family and the animals and uh, communication between the animals and the people as to how they were to coincide here in Mi'kmaq. Um, we had stories about moose cap throwing the five legendary sods of stone at giant beaver to create the five island chains. Uh, we got the three sisters uh, where three sisters were playing a prank on Goosecap as he was hunting a moose. Every time Goosecap got close enough to the moose, these sisters would chase it off a little bit farther. When Goosecap found out um, what they were up to, he turned them to stone and they're still there off of the um, 
off of the crypts of uh, Cape Chignecto. And uh, they said, nice little park and little walking trail in there you can get to and little picnic tables up there that you can lunch with the three sisters. So uh, they're still there. And even our departure story where Glooscap left on the back of a whale. And for the whale giving Glooscap a journey, Glooscap gave the whale his pipe. That's why whenever you go on a whale watch, you see that little that little blow stem off of the uh, the whale. It's uh, basically the smoke from Glooscap's pipe, as our legends go. Uh, stories about Glooscap breaking up a giant water dam in the Bay of Funde, even places like uh, West Advocate Beach or Driftwood Haven that looks like a large beaver dam that had been busted up. Uh, we've got stories about Goose Cap making an amethyst necklace for his grandmother on Partridge Island. Partridge Island was one of Goose Cap's grandmother's campsites, and one of his campsites was Cape Blomidon, just across the bay, some two, two miles. And what you have is, um, what you have is, is um, you've got stories that are site specific. I mean, talk about Glooscap making an amethyst necklace. Um, you go to Partridge Island, you're going to find amethyst. It's part of the inventory there. And literally, the the things that you find, you're sort of walking on the beach, finding things that have been cobbled and knocked off. I mean, what you're looking at is you're looking at this. I don't know if you can see that copper that you're finding there. And even that it's sort of a um, tarnished copper. And you crush it up and underneath there's the veins of it grow. So it's not growing up this way, exposing all the amethyst. It grows this way and this is what you're looking at. I tell them that people that there's amethyst in Parsborough and they're like, I walked all around that island. I never found anything. I said, you see all this green stuff there? And they're like, oh yeah, there's plenty of that. <laughs> and I'm like, the amethyst is inside. <laughs> so yeah, you gotta know what you're looking for as well as where to look. But again, that's a very, very desirable material to make tools from, and it is very, very hard. We got a story about Glooscap having a magic, or Glooscap's grandmother having a magic cooking pot, and she was always ready to receive company. If a uh, company came and cut off a piece of stew meat, the stew meat would just grow back, because we were always ready to receive. And that area is right on a volcanic fault line, it is full of what's called vesicular basalts, and they have all these little holes in them, air holes, as the material started to cool. When the tide comes in twice a day, every day, the tide comes in and pushes the air out of these rocks, and the water boils and bubbles like a cooking pot. You can go there and see. Um, in fact, if you look in on the internet, you're going to find the tide times in the Bay of Funde. Uh, look for Parsboro. Parsboro high tide times. If you're looking at what's going to be like a high tide at noon today, you want to be there about two hours early because this process happens as the tides are rising and pushing the air out. So you don't want to go at noon, you want to go at 10. So uh, yeah, because if you go at the high tide time, you've already missed it. So it happens for about an hour, hour and 45 minutes. But again, that story of Japichkin that I told definitely refers to land changes, uh, the character that evokes in legends. These, these um, characters and stories that we have, they form boundaries and you get so many of them. It's like you talk about the spirits of the land. Um, Muj is Mi'kmaq for spirit. And you've got Udalata Muj, Pudalata uh, Muj, Wikalata Muj, Skadaga Muj. It's like, uh, these are all different elements of nature. There's water spirits, there's stone spirits, there's um, spirits of the wind, spirits of wood. It's like, these are all the elements there. And we set these restrictions that way our kids don't go playing off. You know, he's telling them a little story about the creatures that live in the woods. Uh, and so they don't wanna go in there because there's a little bit of fear. And it's like, well, that's a good thing because there's creatures in the woods that like the soft tissue of humans and uh, yeah. So that was a good way of keeping them out of harm's way. And again, uh, I don't know what happened here. We got a duplication of some of this stuff. Uh, it just shows the liquid material pouring out in the bay and cooling as the other liquid material is coming out on top of it and pulling all these different layers. It's just 
pouring and cooling, pouring and cooling. And uh, that's basically what we have today. And even in these channels, you see things like um, veins of agates and quartzites that you're seeing. These here are all basically all uh, agates that you're seeing. And um, yeah, this is basically where we play. It's like you know, I spend my evenings and weekends with my families uh, running around doing a lot of this um, hunting for materials. So yeah, and yeah, you know what happened? All this duplication. Anyway, Carsborough was a very, very important site, especially in the month of August. Uh, Mid-August, they have host three different events in the town of Parsboro, and they're basically initiated by the Nova Scotia Mineral and Gem Society. One of the ones is the Nova Scotia Gem and Mineral Show and Sale, where people bring semi-precious jewels from all over the globe to buy, sell, trade, and collect. Another one is the Nova Scotia Rock Hounding Roundup, where you can actually get out in the Bay of Funday and collect some of these materials yourself. And the third event is called the Lapidarian's Dream. And Lapidarians are basically people who take semi-precious stones and create jewelry out of them. Very, very desirable material, very, very rare in its creation. So this uh, material is valuable to jewelers. And again, looking at the inventory in Nova Scotia and looking at the fault lines, you definitely know where to go. Uh, this here is in the um, Bay of Fonde at uh, uh, Scotts Bay area between Cape Blomberton and Cape Split. And when you take a look at these collections, it's like these were all broken off. These were larger pieces that someone has snapped down a big stone to reduce it to a workable um, tool. So these are just the debris that was left from the process of tool making. And you're seeing parts and pieces of these things. You're finding them in the soil. It's like, you know, they're starting to erode from the shorelines. And the rain claims a lot of this stuff and deposits it back in the ocean and the tides take it away. So just seeing it in these exposed area and being created very, very uniquely. I mean, you take a look at this type of banding that you've got in the soil with the quartzite beside the amethyst, beside the jasper. It's like, it definitely forms in different materials that you can see even seeing hammer stones there. And it's like, this is the tools that people were using to fashion some of those rocks into tools. And you can see the evidence of people chipping and chipping away literally over and over again. And because that material is so hard, you're breaking your hammer stone. It literally works away. And once someone was done, they just threw it on the side, worry about doing it and getting it another day. And all the chips and pieces that you're finding are all culturally significant. And again, this is us just out on the landscape um, harvesting, my son Kyle and I, and just finding all this material and pieces of them. Uh, when you we take a look at some of the tools and the pieces that we have from Migmoy to Burt, you're seeing a lot of the material is much the same. You take a look at that large piece that's up there. That was an a donation that was given to us by a man by the name of uh, Mr. Jim Grew from Bass River. And when you take a look at this sample that he pulled out of a river in behind his house, there was a vein of this agate that grew there. He pulled off this piece and he said, this is significant to the Mi'kmaq people. And sure enough, when we went to Ottawa and we looked at the collection of Mi'kmaq de Burt, we pulled off all these tools that were made from the same stone. So we know that here's Migmoy de Burt and some 10 kilometers as the crow flies, this is where they were harvesting the material to take there. Uh, this is some of the other ones. This is that orange agate that I was talking. And a lot of this is surficial. It's like right on the surface. You can actually see where it has bubbled up and cooled. That's not a piece of it. Uh, even where uh, everything from glacial debris is, um, uh, there's glacial channels where all this thick ice was on there, the lands were moving, and the ice was taking this very, very hard stones and scraping them up against other pieces, and there's grooves left inside of it. It's like all these uh, events tell a story, and that points to a certain specific time in Nova Scotia's creation. Uh, this piece, um, I think I'll just, uh, I don't know how I'm doing for time there, uh, but, uh, 
I want to go through at least one more sample. And this here is an artifact that you're seeing there close to the color palette. And these are the samples that were taken from Davison's coat. Now, this projectile point was found at Grand Lake Flowage by the chief of the Bear River First Nation, Mr. Chief uh, Frank Muse. And to put it into perspective, there's the Enigma First Nation of Bear River just down by Digby. Grand Lake Flowage is a little um, northeast from there. And the actual site where that material or rock is found is Davison Skull, Spain. And when you take a look at the lithic samples that we collected from Davison Skull, you can see with the microscope, and again, looking at the crystallization of the material created, it's like pockets of crystallized quartz that are found in the points are also found in the lithic site. Uh, samples. Bands of crystallized quartz found in the point are found there as well. You can see that banding and color. Uh, dark areas of agate that indicate that this was preheated. If you take a semi-precious stone and you heat it for days under a constant heat, it naps very, very much more easily and it uh, retains its edge. It's almost like you're, you're firing something to make it harder. And the evidence of this dark areas are definitely heat treated materials. Uh, even areas of the light colors that found in the points, uh, something like um, chalcedony and porcelain chalcedony, uh, found both in the samples as well as the lithic sample and the artifact. And again, that points to our story sites, our sites of uh, lithic materials. They definitely tell that story. It's like, uh, so all these things are connected. Nope, if on day story sites, uh, I don't know, I've got, I've got a duplication of a few things here. But let's look at the Nova Scotia Atlas and look at the back part of it. You're finding some 23 places in the province of Nova Scotia called Black Rock. And from these places and locations, you're referring to volcanic basalt. So sure enough, you look at a map and you see Black Rock, that's what you're going to find. And that there is where you're going to find semi-precious jewels created from that volcanic fusion. And yeah, I definitely have duplicates in here. So even when we talk about sites of cultural significance, this is out on Wolf Island. They talk about a goose cap is sitting there on the banks of the island waiting for company. They're referring to the silhouette of this little person sitting there waiting looking off to the shoreline, you can see him sitting there. And uh, right off of that again um, is the bird islands. Uh, this is Blue Caps Cave. And making sure I'm not getting messages from our people. No. But again, Blue Caps Cave up in Cape Daphne, up in Kelly's Mountain in Cape Breton. Uh, definitely a cultural site. And they say that it's been protected by um, a guardian or a maiden. And again, when you look at the hoof face, so that's along the side, you can see the forehead, the eye, the nose, the lips and chin of this guardian of Bruce Cap's cave. These legends have been passed on for generations. And again, going to collect cultural material, you're doing this. Uh, this was a uh, take your kid to school day when my son was in grade nine. A bunch of his uh, friends said, well, I don't want to go to work with dad. I want to go to work with your dad. <laughs> so I ended up with my five slaves for the day and we drove out to Cape Door. And I said, well, the first thing you got to do is you got to leave an offering for anything that you're taking from the land. So I pull out my pouch and all the students were given um, pieces of tobacco and cedar and sage and uh, sweet grass. And Marcus, the little boy there in the blue hoodie there, the uh, he said, who's going to know? We drove for two hours. We're in the middle of nowhere. Nobody is around. Who's going to know that we didn't leave an offering? And I said, Marcus, I said, turn around. When he turned around, you could see this is like an 80 foot, 100 foot cliff of Cape Blomidon. You see the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the chin of this character that uh, definitely sits there overlooking the beach. There's another one even down here where you see the eyes, nose, lips, and jawbone or cheekbone of another character, another one up here, a little one, I don't know if he's wearing a Southwestern, that might be a fisherman for all I know, or maybe a female with a Mi'kmaq peak cap. But again, you see the eyes, the nose, the lips, the chin. 
there's tons of spirits of the land and they're throughout the province and they're definitely cultural significant places. Uh, this place down here, it's actually called the Great Slide. It's between these two cliff, cliff outfaces and all this desirable material that runs through there erodes onto the beach every year. And there's like a rush out there in April and May to harvest the new stuff that's fallen out. And it's only accessible at low tide. You got to watch your tide times. When the low tide is on its way out, you can make your venture up there. It's about a kilometer away. And you've only got a matter of hours before you can harvest and get back before the tide fills back in. So, yeah, this is just part of our cultural thing. Oh, here's some of the pictures. Yeah, and these are my instructors, my teachers of the Migmoy de Burnt Elders Advisory Council. And again, you take a look at their fingers, you're seeing a lot of uh, X. Uh, rings on their fingers and uh, yeah they were well um, well educated Mi'kmaq educators and culture and history people as well as our elders uh, Dr. Medina Marshall uh, from Harvard University uh, uh, definitely she's from Eskasoni um, yeah she just passed uh, not too long ago just like a couple of years same with Dr. Lillian Marshall and Dr. Dougie Knockwood and Elsie Charles Bass. We've lost a few members uh, since uh, we started with this group. And uh, even um, Gerald Tony, who replaced one of our elders who passed away, he just recently passed away about a month, month and a half ago. Uh, but this is what you're looking at when you're crawling around and you're finding these little veins of amethysts. And you're seeing these little pockets and pouches. Uh, that little hole that you're seeing right here, and I said encrusted with amethyst all the way around, I could take my fist and shove it in there. That's quite a bigger hole than it looks like. So yeah, and again, the stones and materials that we find in these veins. This is what you're walking over when you're taking a walk on the beach and everybody crosses over it. But the thing is, when you cut and polish it, this is what it looks like inside. It's like, that's the same piece of rock. This is the back of it. So yeah, you got to know your material. And our ancestors definitely knew that. And they had a great connection to the geological inventory. So I think that's about it for me. And I'm going to get into question period, I guess. So if Sabrina wants to hop back on. And, yes, and, sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I know that there's <clears throat> people who are very appreciative of <clears throat> Oh. everything you're saying and uh, I think you reinforce what um, <coughs> was saying and Clifford Paul was saying about the importance of two-eyed seeing how much science and our knowledge systems are interconnected and uh, you have the same outcome so what I mean by that is you're hearing from Gerald that uh, our legends explain a lot that also can be explained through um, geological transformations and, and just history in general so you can see how the two blend really well together and why it's so important to appreciate and value both types of systems uh, i know there's a lot of interest in this speaker series i'll get to the question shortly uh, for those individuals who are also um like tonight as i mentioned we have uh lorraine and sarah talking about the history of the two local communities and we're talking about athletics later on this month but another piece that we're aiming to have later on as well uh, outside of the speaker series with the the dean of research uh, of graduate studies and research is a speaker series specifically aimed at research and ethics in indigenous communities and this really connects to all of that and why i'm saying this is because we're having a lot of questions asking if this session is being recorded it is it's going to be available online on the indigenous affairs page at Acadia U, but I want to note that all of the information that's coming out of this session and all of the sessions previous and moving forward as well are owned by the Mi'kmaq. The intellectual property is that of the Mi'kmaq. So Acadia is being a gracious host to provide this platform of knowledge for individuals, but um, as researchers we and as academics who that's the audience that we're aimed at, we really want individuals to understand the challenges we've had with research in the past and present 
and ethics and to really know and understand that all of this information that you're getting is not yours to use however you want. It's the Mi'kmaq's knowledge. So always come back to us, see if it's appropriate for use uh, in your different um, mediums. We know that professors at Acadia are going to be connecting this to their coursework, which is what we really want. But what we're saying is just remember that it is our knowledge and that the intellectual property is owned by the Mi'kmaq. And that's a big shift that we're trying to push around the world in terms of Indigenous knowledge and use of an Indigenous knowledge. One of the things before we get to the questions as well is that you would have seen that I put in the, the chat or the Q&A information on Mi'kmaq Way de Burt. So this is where Gerald works. They have been working for decades to create a cultural center there and they're working very hard to secure funds. A challenge for us in our Indigenous communities is not only are we the most impoverished populations within Canada, but we don't have access to funds or own source revenue in the way that municipalities do, provinces, federal government does, uh, other institutions. We're really working hard to get funds for ourselves and there's limited funds available and we're competing against one another for these funds for important infrastructure developments, among other issues as well. Uh, Mi'kmaq Way de Burt is a significant project, not just for the Mi'kmaq, <clears throat> but for Nova Scotians and Canadians in general. So I know a lot of people coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement are also looking at ways that how can we give to Indigenous communities within Canada. And I have always said, reach out to your local Indigenous communities and see how they need help. One way for us in Nova Scotia and in the Mi'kmaq is Mi'kmaq Way to Burt. So if you click on that link that I provided, you can actually see on their main webpage a spot where you can donate. So if you really want to be a good ally to us, this is one of those initiatives that you should definitely support and help because it's benefiting all of us. And again, as my shirt says, we are all treaty people. So you're contributing to your history and your future and the future of everyone by giving to this. So that is my little rant. I apologize for everyone hearing that, but it's important. Um, so we're getting to some questions and Gerald, you can correct me. I'm going to try to jump on this question as well. Um, it, the question was that was all of Newfoundland always considered part of Mi'kmaq? I was told that just the West Coast was related because the rest was Beothic. Now, my understanding to that and from working at negotiations in KMK was pre-contact, Mi'kmaq was PEI up the Gaspé Peninsula in New Brunswick up to Quebec and Nova Scotia, and we expand it more so after contact, especially with the British into Newfoundland and Maine because of the conflicts we had. Is that correct, Gerald, or uh, how would you respond to that question? All I know is that I was told that there was uh, nine different districts and two of them are combined districts. And uh, Prince Edward Island is joined with Picto and uh, Anaganish County, so it was Abigueda Picto, one of the districts. The second one that's combined is on uh, Newfoundland, Takamcook, and Cape Breton Island. So it was Takamcook, Akunamagi. And there are tons of references that talk about people from Cape Breton going to Newfoundland to harvest different things and uh, even different migratory animals, uh, definitely connected to walrus, which was sort of out of our range at certain times. So people went there. And again, even when you refer to Takam Cook and look at the word being a large piece of land that sits across. And it's like that does indicate that, yeah, that the initial um, word came from our side to explain who these people were. But even when you take a look at their history over in Newfoundland, um, and you reference the Beothic. The Beothic people were still part of our nation. We were still part of um, the Algonquian language. Uh, we were, the Mi'kmaq were basically coastal on the southern part and the western part of Newfoundland. But Beothic, when you look at the 
original Mi'kmaq word or Algonquian word, it refer, refers to the people of the interior. And so we believe that we are still one and the same, but they just lived inland as opposed to coastal. So there are, I don't know, rules for argument, but even as for that um, migration path of our people moving in here some 13,300 years ago, Newfoundland would still be encrusted in that series of ice probably for another couple thousand years before the ice place had freed all those lands. So the connection there, it's like, you know, and even uh, I was on the west coast of Newfoundland at St. Anthony, the most northerly west point, and you can look off to Labrador. It's only like 18 miles away. And uh, I'm like, you can't tell me our people weren't here, but they weren't there. It's like, and then even when you look farther into Europe and you talk about how the native indigenous people had came across from China over the Barren Strait, it's like that's one theory of a migratory path. And to me, I feel that that refers a lot to our West Coast tribes and even Hawaiians. There's a strong connection to Asian culture, even in their language. It's very lyrical as opposed to ours, which is very guttural. Then you go to um, Europe and you're seeing a migratory path coming from that side again on the ice. It's like the Basque society. It's like there are so many words in the Basque culture that are part of the Algonquian language. So you can't tell me that those two nations were connected at one time. Now, of course, that Eurocentric view says that these indigenous groups migrated over here. And I'm like, no, I think we were already here and they contacted us and learned a lot from us and went back to wherever they were. But there's a cultural connection there to the Basque and it's definitely undeniable when you look at the language and literally dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of words have brought their people to our nation to study language. And there was even like language symposiums held by these Europeans and Mi'kmaq on the East Coast. It's like, why, just, why is this so much? It's like, no. But uh, yeah, there's still a lot to be un uh, unfolded. Um, I was talking to uh, Dr. Stephen Loring from the Smithsonian Institute, and he literally took the Americas and he mapped it out for me from North America, Central America, and South America. And what he pointed to was the oldest dated archaeological evidence. And it is tied to that ice. When you take a look at Mi'kmaq 13, then you get into Maine, it's like 14, you get into Washington, it's like 15, then it goes 17, 19, 20, uh, 22, and then 30,000 years ago in Central America. And then when you leave Central America and you go to the South, it gets younger again. The people of Ecuador and Peru, like the Quechuan people, when you look at their oldest dated archeological sites, they're the same as us up here, 10,000, 13,000 years. So it's like the, Americas were centralized or colonized from whoever these people migrated into this area in Central America and then spread out in different directions. And even on a more personal note, uh, I went down to Dartmouth there to Princessa Jewelers. I was talking to the owner, Mr. Joel Hernandez. And uh, he said that, like, you know, I'm from Central America. He said, my, uh, my ancestors have been making jewelry out of gold and semi-precious stones for 800 years, literally can trace, right? And he took one look at me, he goes, you're an artist, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, there are people in my community that look exactly like you. He said, and they're all artists. And he was talking about that cultural connection. And he said, I come to your country from Central America. I come here to Canada. You call me an immigrant. He said, I can walk home from here. <laughs> and literally, like when he said that, just that way that he was putting things like, oh, it was uh, nice to meet that man. And he was talking about the same theory that I sort of fall into. But more will be found. Um, there are some people that say that they came in from Central America from New Zealand. And then when you take a look at New Zealand and their language, and we've had our Millbrook, our Mi'kmaq elders group go down to New Zealand. And again, that that vocalization, the, the stories, uh, there's a cultural connection there somehow. And uh, yeah, we'll find out more as we study and more things are shared. But uh, yeah, who knows for now? <laughs>
kind of building on that connection and how we're all all related um we actually have a cousin who's Maliseet who's asked a question um yeah. and they said we have a Maliseet legend about a water monster called Abu Tuguin I'm probably saying that wrong is there a similar legend with the Mi'kmaq um there are reference to Japichkum spending time in the water and there is a lot of um of evidence of of course land changes at the water's edge or underneath the water and uh this Apukinajit character uh, he's found in all societies i mean you can study chinese culture and you'll find that they have a horned serpent you can study the vikings of course they have horned serpents it's like every culture in the planet earth has got these legends of mythical creatures that uh are connected uh, same with our little budalatamuj or wikalatamuj just like this like little fairies or little like their own little elves or different things like uh, gremlins or something it's like every culture shares a lot of things and just like even our every culture in the planet has a creation story and it's like they have a form of spirituality it's like to me it's not like the message is different and like when you take a look at them they all saying the same things right i mean we signed on to christianity in 1610 with the baptismal of um chief member two and his family and it's like they're telling the story from their land father son and holy ghost and we're like well that's niskam gazul and guska the son of the creator was sent here to teach us like someone who left the people and said that they would return in our time of need like there's so many parallels to these stories and cultural stories then even when you look at the christian bible itself it says that jesus and his followers have left for different lands to teach these things to different people and so it's like they're all saying the same thing so i'm like well i'll follow along with that until my passing days when i get the real answer i guess <laughs> but yeah hello so, was... sorry continue no. Jeremy to cut oh, you off oh no, okay. i was just going to say there's a lot more to learn so yeah got to get out there and research more and research heavier and see where these connections are made because that's what archaeology is you're taking elements from the past as pieces of a puzzle to put things together to show you the big picture and i i love it like uh, i uh, i think it's amazing um and like I, on oh, that uh, puzzle yes um, kind of we have a question related to the digital place name atlas yes um, and they just said they're curious as to whether or not the river called currently called cornwallis um is called let me see i was trying to work on my pronunciation jujukowich right. um, the narrow river all the way from the mouth of the river to its origins north north of berwick i've right. heard this is a name applied to different rivers. For example, the Annapolis River. The verb-based nature of the Mi'kmaq language makes me wonder. So yeah. is Jujukowicz used specifically for that river, I guess, is their question, or is that just no. really to mean? No, it's not. And in fact, if you look farther at that map, you'll find other places that have the same name. And again, when you come to a verb and you're describing something, you can look at the cliffs of um, the North Mountain, there are a lot of rivers and water systems that talk about the place where the water runs rapidly. Then you look at an elevation map and it's like, that's because it's on a cliff. Of course, water's gonna run faster on a hill. So that's what these places are named. It's more of a description of what happens there and not a site specific place that says, this is called this and that thing. You, know, you gotta call something something else. No, it does the same thing, you say the same thing. It's like, it's a verb, it's a description and like I said, there's many, many places with the same name. Uh, even when they were talking about Halifax Harbor and they were talking about Shibuktu, and they're saying that you look in the tourism book and it's like Shibuktu means the great harbor or the big harbor. And we're like, no, Buktu refers to Buktue or fire. It means a great fire. Our elders advisory council were saying there's other places in Migamagi with that same name. And what they were talking about was the capital gathering areas in each one of the seven districts where they would have the council fire, part of the ancient grand council. This was their meeting grounds where they had their big meetings in different districts. So that's why Shabuktuk is more than one place. They went 
to more than one place to gather for meetings. It's like, yeah. So no. And again, if they got something as easy as a place where the river is narrow, there's a lot of narrow rivers uh, that go by the same name. And uh, can you please remind us where the Great Slide is located? Uh, it's in um, Cape Door. And again, you can literally see the eroded material out on the beach. When you go down to the, the Cape Door Lighthouse where you access the shoreline, you can just look up and see it's about a kilometer up the beach. And uh, where is uh, Gloose Caps Cave located is another question. Yeah, that is basically on uh, Cape Daphine, um, on Kelly's Mountain up in Cape Breton. And it's just, you can see like the Bird Islands are right outside of it. And the Bird Islands actually look like a broken canoe. called uh, Gloose Cap Stone Canoe was broken. And of course, birds live all there. And that's why it's called the Bird Islands today. But that's right outside of Kelly's Mountain and Blue Caps Cave. Uh, another thing that is referred to as the Fairy Holes, because that there is where um, the volcanic basalt has all these little pockets of it in the walls. And they said that's where all the little fairies live. There's a lot of stories about that as well. Uh, and again, there's a walking trail. You can drive down into there. Um, if you're driving to Sydney on, what is it, uh, 105? Uh, you come to that really, really sharp hairpin turn before you go over the bridge. And um, right there at that sharp hairpin turn, there's a little parking lot. You can drive in there, you park there, and then you can walk. It's about a six kilometer walk to uh, Goose Caps Cave from that parking lot. And the path has been used by Mi'kmaq people so long that it's, it, you, you can't get lost on it. Once you're on the path of Goose Caps Cave, you're on the, the path. So you can see it. Uh, get a hold of some of the local people like Clifford, uh, <laughs> Clifford Paul. He's like, yeah, he's definitely, he, he was one of the first ones to take me there, him and Andrew Sark uh, from PEI. And Clifford took my wife and I, Natalie, down there. Uh, like I said, once you get down into there, it's quite a, quite a climb down. And uh, I get down there pretty good, but I'm a pretty big boy. I had a, a nice time getting back up out of that hole. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's pretty good. And that's, I think, what we should also remind folks is visiting some of these sites. They're very uh, significant and sacred to the Mi'kmaq. So if you haven't been to them um, and you're not Mi'kmaq, or even if you are, make sure that you are going with someone who knows the history and the story. So like Gerald's saying for Goose Caps Cave, go see someone like Clifford Paul to take you there to know yeah. the proper protocol, because we have had issues like with Goose Caps Cave where people have gone and done graffiti. Yeah. These are really significant places for us, same as in Keji Makujik with our high um, petroglyphs there. People have oh, done yeah. there as well. So um, just remember, these are cultural sites for us and um, yeah. in a respectful way and, and find the appropriate Mi'kmaq folk who can take you to these places yeah. and give you the knowledge like Gerald is in the story so you can truly appreciate them uh, as we do. Yeah, and even a point of reference from that, story was um i'm 62 years old i've been going to keji makujik national park um, which was my ancestral home i mean the glowed bay glowed point glowed island big glowed island little glowed island glowed field glowed field road it's like that's where our family come from and when we used to go down there there was a burial site there and we're talking about the 70s here this is over 40 years ago there was a series of headstones in the um, graveyard that had petroglyphs and these rock drawings on the headstone show different animals, depending on your family and your family clan. And we went back there recently. There's one petroglyph left that's all fenced around. When I was asking about, they said all the other headstones were stolen. Like, Why would you steal a headstone? It's like, you know, it's just because it's an, an ancient rock drawing. It's like, you need that for your collection. I'm like, that's somebody's head uh, grave marker. So yeah, that's pretty sad to see one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, do you have any other questions or? Got two more. Uh, one is just a quick question asking with the slide that you had of the table of contents from that one book. Uh, they're right. just wondering what is that book? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I was gonna say that. Of the Micmacs by Rand. Uh, no, I don't think it is. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you that and I'll email you that answer as soon as I dig it out. But um, 
yeah, we, we did write that one. And we had another question and I, I answered it and you can expand upon it. It was a question about what is more appropriate to use, Mi'kmaq or Mi'kmaq? Um, and, and why would one be more inappropriate? And I just explained that at one point, Micmac was yeah. in the term, but it's more appropriate to use right. Mi'kmaq and uh, you, that you'll even hear us Mi'kmaq folks saying Ilnu, but that's going to create even more confusion for people, but it's more <laughs> Mi'kmaq. Right. Yeah, as in Mi'kmaq is definitely an anglicized version of our traditional word and probably been about 20, 25 years now when people started to get very political correct as to how we do it. So it's like, let's go back to the original Mi'kmaq. And again, that refers to that relationship that we had with the French. It's like we were Mi'kmaq to the French. Like my family or friends or allies with your family. That was a French thing. The English adopted it after they booted them out in 1755. But um, again, like you said, you talk to some of the Cape Bretoners, the old school ones, they're like, we were Mi'kmaq to the French. It's like, we are Ilno. That's our word for the people. Like we are Ilno. So uh, yeah, there is quite a bit of controversy around how you use that word, but Mi'kmaq is just the old anglicized version. Mi'kmaq would be the politically correct one, but Ilno is definitely uh, our word for ourselves. And I said, just to add more confusion for folks who are participating in this, depending where you are in Mi'kmaq, is depends on how we spell Mi'kmaq. So True. I said, Nova Scotia, we use the Smith Francis orthography. Yep. Um, New Brunswick spells it differently and Quebec spells it differently. I think PEI spells it the same way that we do. Right. Um, but you definitely know who the writer is based off right. the way of spelling it. And uh, it's a point of poking at one another in terms of how we each spell it. Yeah. Um, and again, but, the Americans, they call them, they, they go by old school Micmac. So, like, yeah. And even I've, I've seen a chief's medallion and on the back of it, it had an inscription that was M-I-C-K-M-A-C-K. So it was Mick and Mac. So I don't know if we're Irish or Scottish. So I don't know. <laughs> Definitely connected there. <laughs> we have a, a few more questions flowing in. This one I think you'd really enjoy answering, but it, it goes... <laughs> to um, your action figures, Gerald. Uh, oh. are <laughs> behind you, Mi'kmaq. Well, there, yeah. Uh, no, I've got a few native ones, native dolls in there. But um, yeah, just a comic book nerd and, of course, an artist. Google Gerald Glode comic book art. You'll see thousands of pieces. Uh, back in 2015, I won a competition as the best comic book artist online. And uh, I... They actually, the top 10 list, I was number nine, I was number seven, and I was number one. And they did a feature on me on Disney XD, and they featured literally a couple dozen of my art pieces on the Disney one. And that was back in 2015 when they were working with Marvel Comics to produce Ant-Man. So, yeah, like I said, big comic book nerd, big comic book artist, and yeah, I got thousands of pieces out there. And all of the beautiful artwork that you did see in Gerald's PowerPoint has been produced by Gerald. And I will note um, the nickel, there oh. was indigenous art on the nickel a few released a few years ago. So yeah. the person who won that competition and whose artwork is featured on our nickel is Mr. Yeah. Gerald Yeah, I've yeah, got the, was it Canada's 150th birthday back in 2017. So oh, yeah, and then did another one this year for the Royal Canadian Mint, and it's a two ounce uh, piece of silver bullion, and it's got the Kraken on it. Uh, the Royal Canadian Mint is doing a near, new series called uh, Mythical Creatures of the North, and I did the first coin was the Kraken. So yeah, I've been having some fun. <laughs> and, uh, someone said, how far is Cape Door? I guess it depends well, on where they're located, but. <laughs> true, yeah, but again, once you cross the Canso Causeway, you're probably within an hour of it. So, like, yeah, almost like uh, three quarters of the way to Sydney, maybe hour, hour and a half. I can Google that for you too and give you a map. So they can punch in wherever they're coming from. There's a question about what is the digital place name. Um, if you just scroll up on the Q and A, someone has actually put a link to that digital place name, so you can find it right there. Um, mm -hmm. 
There is another question. Will it be become possible to have Mi'kmaq places names posted on signs or an app so people can have access when we travel around Mi'kmaq? We'd like that, we, wouldn't we, Gerald? Yeah, sure we would. Push but, um, yeah, do it. I don't know. We, we just need to get somebody elected in as the premier of Nova Scotia, like uh, um, the Rodney did there back in the day for the Celtic ones up in Cape Breton. And, uh, yeah, he did pretty good there. That's where but, yeah, the importance of we want it, oh, like it. The answer we keep getting back is it costs dollars, but we okay. are in Mi'kmaq and this is the land of the Mi'kmaq. So why isn't everything written in Mi'kmaq? as well we agree okay. with that question being an issue so yes push your like gerald saying push your mlas to make change push your municipal <laughs> lead to make changes in the municipality and we at acadia are trying to make that change on campus as well because it's important yeah. oh you've seen a you've seen a few places going back to old school even starting with the first nation communities themselves uh like areas like afton like Afton First Nation is now Button Cape. It's like, you know, so you've got Bear River instead of Bear River, it's like Elsick. It's like, you know, they're, they're going back. And even Millbrook itself, like, you know, Millbrook is a very European name, but the traditional name was um, Wekobikwit. And in the verb based language, Wekobikwit means end of bay. When you look at the Bay of Funday that runs into the Minas Basin that runs out to where the Salmon River comes in, that's Truro or Millbrook. Or where Kobe Quid. That's where Kobe Quid Educational Center come from. The high school here. It's named uh, Nigma name. So, yeah, we'll and get it in there. We're gonna. We'll, we'll get it there. We'll <laughs> yeah. Nova Scotia is doing great things. I would say uh, we're a great example across the country on really great partnerships between the Migma and the provincial government. So slow and steady. We're little turtles making the way. Um, there is a question, and I'll answer this one. It's a, and definitely though, Gerald too can weigh in. Um, it's someone, a municipal councillor from Cumberland County, and wanting to know about doing a land acknowledgement. What's the best wording? My personal recommendation is I know that Acadia, we have wording that we use. There's a lot of institutions and places that have wording. For me, I think it's important to do something that's authentic and personal to an individual. So just reading a piece of paper and verbatim is a good step. But my opinion is how how is it important to you? How do you acknowledge being a part of this land and speaking from the heart? Because when you speak from the heart, it is more authentic. And I think it connects to people a bit more. That's my personal opinion. Um, mm -hmm. But Jennifer, you can email me directly and, and I can provide more support on that. Um, but Gerald, what are your thoughts around that? Well, uh, other people have asked me about that question and there is actually a document that you can get online that talks through the reference of our from our uh, place when it involves like um, colleges and universities and other educations of higher learning. They have their little paragraph that says what they say. And again, depending by the school, this is something that has been blessed through two processes. One is the Mi'kmaq Ethics Watch, which is up in Cape Breton out of uh, CBU. I do believe Lindsay Marshall and Stephen Augustine. Uh, these are the main guys. And again, um, KMK, uh, Mi'kmaq Quilmaq Wusawagan, which is the, your old job, and the legal rights people. So it's like they would definitely have a hand in that. So, yeah. So that's where Sabrina come from. Uh, yeah, I come yeah, from. That other life. She, she had a, yeah, she had a lot of their life. So. Another life of negotiations. Hence why we don't want to get me started really on <laughs> the friendship treaties, because then we'll have me going forever and ever. <laughs> a whole other session yeah. on that. Um, an important question is, where can we purchase some of your beautiful work? Oh, well, unfortunately, the only place that carries that is my brother's basket shop. And we were born into a basket making family and we had a basket shop all through the 50s and 60s. And my brother bought Basil's old place. Of course, Basil being connected to your family, too. Yeah, and my uncle. Before Basil passed. Yeah. And uh, we bought Basil's place. And that's the only place I sell my artwork. 
But other than that, you would probably go online and s download copies of my work that are so large that uh, you can definitely um, get something printable out of there. Download you, it, take it to Staples. Mm, or, I can oh, hire whatever. you for mission artwork too. Oh, well, there, no, I, I, that's, that sounds like work. <laughs> Doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> yeah, no, but again, uh, I, I did a few different sessions like um, International World of Astronomy, uh, donate a piece that's available online. I think it's like 30 meg. So you can definitely download that and print something as big as your fridge. It'll be super sharp, clean and clear. There's, there are pieces out there that I've donated. Um, the Geopark that's up there and um, all through that sort of Cumberland County, the shoreline up there. Uh, prominent place for Mi'kmaq people and they have taken a lot of pieces of my artwork for signage. I'm like, that's free to use too. Something I've already done, something you can take and use. So we only have one question left, but before I get to it, we have a number of comments and they're all just saying how phenomenal your presentation is, Gerald, oh. and how much they're valuing what you have to say. Um, the comments are like this long each individually, um, but <laughs> just going, how valuable you are to all of us and your knowledge and how appreciative they are to listening to you. Um, the very last question we have, it says, what is the correct name of the Acadian forest region? I've heard both Wabanaki forest and the Wabanaki forest. Can you explain right. the difference? No, between Wabanaki and Wabanaki, again, it's like you said, there's dialectic differences from different districts and it just depends on who they're getting it from. And again, I can't refute either way as being incorrect. And again, looking at what the words say, like, you know, what's the difference between Wabanaki and Wabanaki? It's like, I don't know, ek, I, I'm seeing the people. So either one would be correct. One just refers to people of the dawn. The other one's referring it to um, like, the people of the early morning light. This could be something as simple as that. Just a one syllable difference could mean one different word. But, well, yeah. thank you, Gerald. That is all of our questions. Thank you for everyone who's attended. Uh, this evening, as I said, we have another session that's starting at 6.30 about the history of Loose Cap and Annapolis Valley First Nations featuring Lorraine Whitman and Sarah McDonald talking about this. Before we conclude, I just really need to give a huge thanks. Um, Sherry Turner is the one who set up this whole uh, series technology wise and has been phenomenal providing support. And Natalie and Karen are two individuals who have really worked hard to support these initiatives. And then today specifically, we have uh, Gabrielle and Valerie and Hannah who have made this whole thing possible. All of you on this event, you can't see the back end, but these folks are the ones who are keeping an eye on the Q&A as well as doing all the producing. So you can see Gerald and I popping in and out. And so it's seamless and beautiful. And so they really deserve so much thanks and appreciation because they're volunteering their time and making sure that this is a great production for you all. So my big thank you to all of you. Yeah, for. <laughs> For everyone, I know a lot of questions keep coming in. Is this recorded? And I'll reiterate it again. Yes, it's being recorded. Give us a week or so um, and we will be posting it online on the Indigenous Affairs webpage at Acadia University. Of course, we'll be circulating the recordings and making sure that organizations like CMM, Mi'kmaq Way to Burt under CMM have access to all of this because they are the owners of this information anyway. Um, but again, thank you everyone for tuning in and hopefully we see some of you this evening and then on the 24th is our very last session. So, Walalio everyone and Walal and Gerald for, for speaking today. Very appreciate it. Well, thanks for the invite. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>